thank you very much to my colleagues here at Mesa College for the invitation. It is greatly appreciated, and it's wonderful to see all of you here. Um, I decided, since it is midway through the semester, to give a mellow talk, mostly full of pretty pictures, right? Which is, if any astronomer says they didn't get into astronomy for the pretty pictures, they're lying. They are lying, right? It's all about the pretty pictures. And also, um, one of the things I also do is I'm the co-founder of Astronomy on Tap San Diego. And so the last time I gave this talk, it was in a brewery, which I think is appropriately mellow for the halfway point of the semester, right? So let's just enjoy some pretty pictures. But first, I have to start off with the subject most passionate in my heart, which is Star Wars. All right, so, so you might recognize this as a scene from The Last Jedi. Um, and this is one of the production stills. And I just loved this shot. It's dramatic. You've got these new speeders. It's a vehicle we haven't seen before. And you've got this white plane, and it's kicking up red dust. And so immediately you want to wonder, what is, like, what is those red dust? And if you'll remember from the movie, there is this sequence and I didn't have the sound on here, but he basically does this. And does anyone remember what this character says? I knew it. I knew some of you would know. So he reached down, he licked the dirt, and he said, salt. If you look in the credits, this character is listed as salty. It's true. So he reached out, he grabbed a bit of the dirt, and he said, salt. And it was funny to go on social media the next day because my timelines were split. You could tell who the scientists were and the non-scientists. Because the non-scientists is like, who eats dirt? That's what the non-scientists were saying. And all the scientists were like, this is the first time we've ever seen science done in Star Wars. Because of course you're going to taste the dirt. You know why? Because you can't because they saw, oh look, where our feet go, it basically brings up the top layer of soil and it shows us something different underneath and it's red and it's vivid and it's different. That tells me something about its composition. I looked at it in that first production still in a magazine well before the movie came out and I went, that reminds me of halite salt crystals. So of course I would have eaten the dirt. That's exactly what you would do in this situation. And the reason why I always like to talk about the colors of space and then use this my dear passion, Star Wars, as an example, is that when we're talking about space stuff, it is very rarely that we have a chance, quite frankly, to eat any of it, right? Occasionally, meteorites fall to Earth. Yay, we're excited about that because that's when space comes to us. We occasionally do uh, sample missions, for example, um, just this past weekend, the Japanese Space Agency, its Hayabusa spacecraft, landed. The little mascot lander with its adorable Twitter feed saying, I'm on the surface of an asteroid and my battery's still lasting. I can keep doing like work. We occasionally go out there and we can taste stuff, for lack of a better term. We send our rovers to Mars, and the Curiosity rover is an SUV-sized roving chemistry lab. It can do spectroscopy, and it can drill, and it can bring up all these samples. We can go there, and we can do more than just look. But pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time in astronomy, we are dependent on the light that we can see, so we need to let the light tell us the secrets. And one of the biggest ways we do that in astronomy actually can just be done visually by looking at color. And so, that's what we want to talk about. What can colors of space tell us? So when you go outside at night and you look up in the sky and you look at stars, you are mostly seeing white dots sprinkled against a black velvet background. But stars have color. Most stars are so far away that your eyes are not getting enough light to trigger your color receptors. So what you're basically looking at up in the sky is light, no light. Right? Signal, no signal. And that's kind of why they look white versus bl the black background of space. A very few occasions, and I'll show you some images, we can actually detect the color differences with our eyes. And one of the things that the color of a star can give us an indication of is its temperature. The, the, the temperature of the star's surface, which is what we refer to as basically the ball of light that we can see. And when we actually do this with physics, uh, this is an example of something called Wien's Law, where the brightness of a star as a function of its wavelength or a frequency, if we can plot the brightness of a star at different wavelengths of light, different colors through different filters, I can fit a unique curve through that, just like if I gave you a bunch of data and said, here, go use Excel and fit a sine curve through it. This mathematical function has a unique characteristic curve, and where it peaks tells us the surface temperature of that star. And so I know that a blue star 
is hotter than a yellow star, which is hotter than a red star, which might be counterintuitive to you because you're used to thinking of things as being red hot. But that's just because in terms of the temperatures that you normally interact with, you're not interacting with stuff that gets more than red hot. Right, about as hot as you get is when you turn on your toaster or your electric stove or your charcoal forgets and they start to glow red. But if we could keep cranking up the temperature, they would glow white. If we could keep cranking up the temperature, they would go blue. And so the hottest objects are actually blue hot. And that means now, if I were to show you a picture of the constellation Orion, you can actually tell me something about the relative temperatures of the stars in this just by eye. Um, if we gave you actual data, you could tell me the exact temperature of each of those stars. But I think sometimes it's kind of powerful to recognize that knowing some basic rules, just looking at something as simple as color, you can tell relative temperatures. So one of the interesting things about Orion is, are, is that its two brightest stars, Betelgeuse and Rigel, are very different colors. So one of them is cooler than the other. Betelgeuse is much cooler than Rigel. If I recall correctly, I think Rigel's about 15,000 Kelvin. Yes, astronomers and physicists use Kelvin as a temperature scale. Forgive us, we just do. And the surface temperature of Betelgeuse is more like 3,000 Kelvin. So that's a big temperature difference between the two. So we, we, one wonders then how can one be as bright as the other if one isn't as hot as the other? Got a couple of options. One could be closer or one could be much bigger. And Betelgeuse is actually an example of something we call a red supergiant. It is cool in temperature, but it's so huge. Its surface area is so big, it's emitting a lot of light so we can see it brightly in the sky. So now when you go outside at night, and Orion has started to rise in the east around midnight, so we're getting going from the fall sky starting to get into the winter sky. Uh, Orion, I choose this constellation to talk about because the color difference is apparent in Orion, just to the naked eye. Uh, you can actually, both stars are bright enough that you can pick up some of the, the, the light with your color receptors and actually tell, oh, one is red and one is blue and get the color differences. So, favorite constellation up on the sky because there's so much pretty stuff in it, but this is not the, these are not the most important stars to you. The most important star to you is the sun. And this is a rather boring image of the sun uh, taken at a Big Bell, Big Bear Solar Observatory. I don't know if any of you have gone to Big Bear and noticed that there is a solar telescope pretty much just on the side of the lake. Um, they do a lot of good work up there, and this was a fairly dull day with just one tiny little sunspot, probably just the size of the Earth, up on the sun. Don't you love astronomy when you can say stuff like that? And you might be looking at this and going, that's not the yellow ball in the sky I draw with my crayons, right? You know, I always ask my students this, what color is the sun? And they're like, well, it's yellow because they've had experience drawing a yellow star in the sky. But the sun is not actually yellow. Have you ever seen a picture of the sun above the atmosphere? What color is the sun? It's white. Uh, it is a white, white star, although because of our astronomical bias here underneath the atmosphere, we refer to it as a yellow star, a yellow dwarf. But if you take a look at the light it's actually emitting, it is a fairly white star. So why is it that we think of it as being yellow? It is really thought that it's because underneath the atmosphere, the sky scatters blue light and it basically, astronomers would say it reddens but from our perspective, it makes the sun look more yellow to us. And that is the leading hypothesis for why we perceive the sun to be yellow. Uh, and also when we tend to look at the sun, because none of you look directly at the sun, right? We are by no means here cond condoning looking directly at the sun, right? But when you do sneak a peek, I, I saw some guilty looks, by the way, excellent. When you do sneak a peek at the sun, you tend to do it when it's lower on the horizon, going through more atmosphere, more blue light getting scattered out of the way, so more reddening has occurred. So we do tend to perceive the sun under the atmosphere to be a yellow star. It's white though. Nice astronauts up on the space station, let us see that. Once we can get the light from a star or from any element, we can start actually taking a look at what 
that element or that star or whatever we're looking at is made of. And so some of you who have taken physics or chemistry classes may recognize these spectra. Uh, the top one is what we call a continuous spectrum all the colors of the rainbow, and I'm biasing this towards what we can see with the human eye. Uh, if we had infrared detectors, we would see it continuing on below the red over here. If we could see in the ultraviolet, we would see the spectrum continuing on over here beyond the violet and so on. But we're used to seeing all the colors of the rainbow up there. And then different elements when they are heated up actually emit different colors. And these patterns can be used as fingerprints to uniquely characterize which element, which molecule that you are looking at. And so uh, in astronomy, we do this a lot. Uh, I heard somebody said they have spectroscopy homework, right? We do this a lot. We try to get the spectrum of stars and the reflected spectrum from, say, planets and planetary atmospheres and so on to give up their secrets. And one of the ways we can do that is by looking at the light, looking for these characteristic patterns. Uh, molecules are always kind of interesting because they, they really do sh tend to show combinations of the atoms that they're made up of. Uh, I don't have water vapor on here, but water vapor really does look like the hydrogen spectrum on a faint oxygen background because there's two hydrogen for every oxygen. You can actually see some of this stuff. So how does this, um, how does this translate to looking at stars? Well, a continuous spectrum is emitted by a heated solid, liquid, or sufficiently uh, thick gas, or dense gas. These, what we call emission spectra, we get these when you have thin gases that are heated up. What do we mean by thin gas? Well, the air in this room is a thin gas. I can see you through it. And so this would be a thin gas. Um, there's also a third type of spectrum, which is called an absorption spectrum. It looks like the continuous spectrum, but with some light missing, like material has absorbed it. And so if, there, if we saw a mercury spectrum in absorption, I would see color, and then I'd be missing two yellow lines. And then I would see color, and then I'd be missing a green line. So basically, absorption spectra look like the opposite of emission spectrum, such that if I added the emission spectrum of mercury to its absorption spectrum, it would look like the continuous spectrum. They complement each other. Why am I bringing that up now? Well, when we take a look at stars, they show absorption spectra. And so this is the constellation Cassiopeia. And for her brightest stars, we have the spectra listed there for you. And you'll notice they look like all the colors of the rainbow are present, but some are missing. And that tells us that stars typically show absorption spectra. And we see absorption spectra here in the laboratory if I have a cooler gas in between the detector and a hot source. This is interesting because this tells us that stars are hotter in the middle. And then as that light filters through their outer layers, through what we call their atmosphere, the cooler outer layers and their cooler outer, outer atmospheres, we now start to get some physics structure from understanding the light. Stars are hotter in the middle than they are around the outside. You might be thinking to yourself, well, that just makes sense. I, I quite frankly don't care if it makes sense if I don't have data to back it up, right? I need actually to have evidence that it works the way we think it does. You may also notice that there are subtle differences in what the spectra look like. Not all stars have the same spectra. It's related to their temperatures, um, the, the elements that we see in them, whether or not they're going to be more processed materials in them. Uh, so the, the spectral types of stars, are, we can actually classify them as the spectral types of stars. They are temperature sequence pretty much exclusively. And then they can, we can use them to tease out the different types of materials in them. And then we go from stars to galaxies. Uh, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It is a spiral galaxy. It is the closest large neighboring galaxy to our own Milky Way uh, at only about 2.5 million light years away, which means that when you take a look at Andromeda, you're not seeing it as it is, but rather as it was 2.5 million years ago, because it took that long for the light to reach us. Uh, Andromeda is visible to the naked eye at this time of year. It's the only galaxy that's visible to the naked eye. Okay, besides our own Milky Way, that wasn't a trick. But it's the only galaxy visible to the naked eye from the Northern Hemisphere. You have to know exactly where to look for it. It's called the Andromeda Galaxy because it's in Andromeda, the constellation. So we're not trying to fool you there either. Up near uh, the Great Square in Pegasus, 
Your eyes are more sensitive to light coming in through your peripheral vision. So you actually don't want to look for Andromeda straight on. You want to look at it like this. There's like this little ghostly blob in the corner of your eye, have light having traveled from 2.5 million light years away to reach you. And the galaxies look like fuzzy blobs. But what you're seeing here is sort of a white fuzz is the aggregate light of so many stars so close together you can't tell them apart. So you're seeing the contributions of the yellow stars, the red stars, the blue stars, the white stars, all adding their aggregate light up together. And then you might notice that there are some dark patches. And then around the edges of this galaxy, you're starting to see a sort of bluish purple. And so what is that? Well, that brings us to nebulae. Um, this is the Witch Head Nebula. It's October. This, this nebula becomes very popular around Halloween because people tend to, to see a witch head in profile. Um, this nebula is an example of something we call a reflection nebula. Why does it shine the color that it does? Well, it's mostly hydrogen, because pretty much everything out in space is mostly hydrogen. It's the most common element in the universe. But hydrogen does not glow blue. If I brought in a tube of hydrogen in here and turned it on for you to look at it, it would be sort of like almost pink. It's sort of reddish pink. Um, so this is not heated up gas. One of the reasons why these are called reflection nebulae is that if I were to take a look at the spectrum of this, it would probably look a whole lot like the spectrum of that star right there. And that is because it's kind of bluish because we're seeing the scattered light hitting the dust grains in this nebula. Um, dust out in space is not like dust in your home. Dust in your home is mostly you right? Skin cells and stuff like that, dirt you track in. It's gross when you think about it too closely, right? That's not what we're finding out in space. Although you have to admit, if we found desiccated skin cells in space, that would be really exciting, right? That's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing little bits of carbon, little bits of silicon, little bits of iron. And those little bits, um, because they are so tiny, because what astronomers call dust, a lot of people would probably think of as large molecule. I mean, like we're not talking like big, big sand grains are huge compared to interstellar dust, right? So they're tiny, which means they're good at scattering the shortest wavelengths of light. The shortest wavelengths of light are more to the blue. So we primarily get blue light scattered off of these. So we got our pretty reflection nebulae here. Um, sometimes nebulae can have two different colors. This is an example of something called the Triffid Nebula. And we're seeing sort of a bluish reflection nebula surrounding a reddish, uh, what we call emission nebula. This is mostly hydrogen in emission. So just like that, if I brought in a hydrogen tube here in the room, cranked current through it and caused it to glow. Um, so this actually allows us to tell, because we can actually see these and we can look at their emission spectra because they're glowing, we can actually tell you this is about 90% hydrogen, about 9% helium, and then assorted other elements based on the colors and the spectra that we see. Uh, this is an example of something, uh, this is uh, the Lagoon Nebula. Once again, another beautiful uh, emission nebula, mostly hydrogen, glowing red due to the heated hydrogen gas. I told you I was going to show you pretty pictures, right? Okay, this is one of my favorite areas in the sky. It's in the constellation Ophiuchus, which is the 13th sign of the zodiac. Um, and this is in Ophiuchus near the constellation Scorpius because this is uh, the star Antares in Scorpius. And I like to show this image because we're seeing a combination. We see the blue reflection nebulae. We see the red emission nebulae. Um, this white blob here is a globular cluster, a big cluster of stars that's actually really, really, really behind, way far away from everything else you see in this image. Um, and then this part down here is yellowish, and there is no yellow nebula. This is actually another reflection nebula. It's just that Antares doesn't emit much blue light, so the particles are attempting to scatter the smallest wavelengths of light. And so it's actually scattering more yellow. And so we're seeing the effect there of the fact that that's just a really, really red star without a whole lot of blue light to emit. And then this is Hubble Space Telescope's 28th anniversary image. And this is part of the Lagoon Nebula, that nebula I showed you two slides ago. And I had to bring this up because a lot of you have gotten used to the Hubble 
Hubble's uh, images. Uh, Hubble's in safe mode right now, which means it's not taking pictures. One of its gyros, they're trying to get it to working again. So uh, when, when Hubble eventually stops working within the next few years, you're going to see a lot of sad astronomers because we're going to stop getting images like this. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope images of nebulae in particular have so permeated pop culture that now when you see nebulae in movies, they're the wrong color because you're seeing them through the Hubble Space Telescope filter set. Like if you see something in Doctor Strange or in Infinity War and you're seeing these like greens and like stuff at the, mm -hmm, no. You're just seeing the, color, the, the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope tends to take its images through three filters. One's a red, one's a blue, one's a green, and then it mixes equally. But the red, the blue, and the green all correspond to different elements. And when they tend to merge them like this, they weight them equally, but are they actually equally weighted in space? No, because everything is 90% hydrogen. And the, the reason why astronomers do this and weight them equally is that the blue, we can actually see physics here. The blue regions are actually hotter. The red regions are cooler. The stuff up here that looks darker and more dense, it actually is darker and more dense. There is actually information to be teased out of what we call this true false color set or a false true color set. Um, uh, one of the uh, astronomers on my PhD thesis committee had taken that famous Eagle Nebula image, you know, the three fingers, the three pillars of creation, they called it. And uh, he will swear up and down that that's a true color image, but it's not what you would see with the eye because these are 90% hydrogen. If you could see them with the eye, they'd always glow red to you because it should be weighted by that 90% hydrogen. So those are some of the pretty things that we see deep out into space. I wanted to spend some time talking about color in the solar system now. And the color in the solar system, the objects that we see in visible light, it's largely by reflection. We largely witness the solar system by how it reflects sunlight. And so an example then, of the way astronomers do it. This is how your eye would do it, right? You have sunlight coming in, a mixture of all the colors of light hits a leaf, but the leaf looks green to you. Why? Because it, the leaf absorbs everything but the green, basically, and reflects the green back to you. What is it in the leaf that's doing that? It's typically the chlorophyll is doing that the most. So the way a scientist would tease out more information is it would actually look at something, in this case I have the absorbance, which is how good the chemical absorbs as a function of wavelength. So chlorophyll is really good at absorbing blue, really good at absorbing red, not so good at absorbing green, so you see it reflected back as green. And different chemicals behave in characteristic ways. We can tease these out as spectra and get information about chemical makeup. So what your eye is doing this way, we can actually get more precise data. But once you train your eye on the colors to look for, you can get a lot just by looking by eye. So shall we do a tour of the solar system in pretty pictures? Always. All right. This is not the moon. This is Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. Uh, it looks remarkably like the moon, though. In fact, in a lot of Astronomy 101 textbooks, they teach Mercury and the moon in the same chapter, because if you've talked about one, you pretty much covered the other. Um, what was This is an image from the uh, Messenger spacecraft, which was around Mercury for about a decade taking images. And we get these big craters, the impacts, um, you can actually have what we call rays sweeping out from the craters. But the surface in many ways was actually darker than what we expected. And it turns out that there's a lot of graphite, like graphite, like in your pencils some of you are using, graphite on the surface. Uh, graphite is a carbon compound. Carbon is one of the most common elements in the universe. And so what we think happened here is that when Mercury was much younger than it is today, so let's turn back the clock about four and a half billion years, as it was forming, it had a lot more magma basically on the surface. And graphite, this common carbonaceous compound, could have crystallized basically out of that graphite.
Um, a lot of people think Mercury, because it's so close to the sun, should be hot and molten to begin with. Sorry to disappoint you. It's actually not that hot. It's only about 800 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, on the side facing the sun. Mercury does not have an appreciable atmosphere, so it's on the side facing away from the sun. Since there's no blanket of atmosphere to keep any heat close to the surface, it's actually negative 200 something Fahrenheit. So you have about an 1100 degree Fahrenheit difference between night and day temperatures on Mercury. But uh, seeing actual graphite on a surface was interesting because you don't necessarily expect to see that. And so I, I've actually found this is one of the more interesting uh, findings of the Messenger spacecraft. I'm biased though because half of my PhD thesis was trying to model graphite out in space. This is Venus. Um, ignore this dot here. That's not real. It's basically an egg in space when you take a look at it. Um, Venus previously earlier on in the semester was a really bright dot over in the western sky in the early evening. Like if you were outside in the early evening, it was waving at you and getting your attention because it was incredibly bright. One of the reasons why Venus is so bright is that its uh, atmosphere reflects about 70% of the light that hits it. So the combination of its highly reflective atmosphere and its closeness to the earth means it gets really bright in the sky. You'll notice though you're not seeing continents, or ice caps, or basically any sort of texture whatsoever. It is a blob in the sky. Um, the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus has caused its atmosphere to, well, do what we don't want Earths to do, right? If anyone ever asks you why are we concerned about climate change, point to Venus, all right? Um, all of Venus's volatiles have gone up into the atmosphere due to the runaway greenhouse effect. It, its atmosphere is 96.5% carbon dioxide, something like that. So it's like 90 something percent carbon dioxide. Um, although very little light gets in, because like I said, 70% of it gets reflected, the light that gets in stays in. And so Venus's average temperature is hotter than the planet's Mercury, even though it's twice as far away from the sun. The yellowish color here is due to sulfur compounds in the atmosphere. We see sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus. We see uh, water vapor in the atmosphere of Venus in very, very tiny trace amounts. If I were to give you water and sulfur dioxide and put you in a chemistry lab with protective gear and a fuel hood, you could make sulfuric acid. And that's basically what the clouds on Venus are made out of. Sulfuric acid clouds, lovely place, isn't it? Um, Venus, for all that it is beautiful in our sky, is probably one of the nastiest places in the solar system. The next planet out from the sun is Earth. I'll assume that you've seen us. So let's go to Mars. The red planet, right? It's been glowing still pretty red up in the sky. It got really bright um, earlier in the semester and it's still catching our attention. Uh, I love looking at Mars. Mars has beautiful textures. You can even pick it up with a small backyard telescope that Mars has ice caps. Um, a combination of water ice and uh, dry ice or carbon dioxide ice. Um, they're seasonal, which means they get bigger in the winter and smaller in the summer. So we can actually see the effects on the very thin Martian atmosphere. Uh, and Mars does have a thin atmosphere, you can tell, because you see clouds over these volcanoes. Um, Mars was named after the god of war because it is the red planet. It can shine very red up in the sky. Uh, so the color of blood, right? So ominous. Uh, why is Mars red? Well, that thin atmosphere does have oxygen in it and the minerals do have iron in them. And so we're getting oxidation. And so Mars is reddish the same way Sedona and Northern New Mexico are red. Same physics, same chemical reactions. And I like to bring that up because when we take a look out into the universe, a lot of times people ask astronomers, why are you wasting our taxpayers' money by doing these things, right? Well, first of all, the taxpayers' money gets spent here on jobs and salaries and things like that. But also, when we look out into the universe, we're studying ourselves. Because if the physics isn't working on Mars the way we think it should be working on Earth, maybe we're wrong about the way things work on Earth. And so we are always, always, always studying ourselves when we take a look out into the universe. And 
I wanted to point out to you just how red Mars can be. So this is a picture from several years ago when it was in the constellation Taurus. You can see the Pleiades there, which is a very blue cluster of stars, a blue-white cluster of stars. So Mars does peek out red in the sky. Oh, Jupiter. I can't even begin to know what to say about Jupiter. Uh, these, this is an image from the Juno spacecraft, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter. Uh, all of the science objectives of the Juno spacecraft could have been met without a camera. This camera was actually put on Juno for education and public outreach. It is built by Malin Space Science Systems uh, here in San Diego County. It is identical to one of the cameras on the Mars rovers. It's like, oh, look, we have a spacecraft going to Jupiter. We have the spare camera. It would be a shame if they didn't meet up and go there together. We are getting the best images ever of Jupiter uh, right now, not because the camera is so good, but because the orbit of the spacecraft is extremely elongated. So sometimes it get, gets much closer. We're talking just a few thousand miles above the cloud tops of Jupiter than we've ever been before. And I just can't get over the texture. It's beautiful. You can tell that this is a mostly big ball of gas. We do think that there is a solid core deep down in the middle. Uh, one of the objectives of the Juno spacecraft is actually to figure out how big that solid core of Jupiter is. Um, the different colors here are different chemical compounds in the atmosphere reacting with solar radiation. So the whitish clouds tend to be ammonia ice. The reddish oranges clouds are ammonia hydrosulfide ice. The bluish tinges tend to be water ice. And so we are seeing different chemical reactions in the clouds actually telling us what they're made of. And also it's just too pretty not to show. I had to restrain myself from just showing you Juno images for like, I don't know, six hours because they're way too pretty. Saturn, next planet out from the sun, reflects back yellow. It doesn't look quite as detailed as Jupiter, although you might be getting a hint of bands of stripes across it. Um, Saturn is more subtle than Jupiter. Uh, it's smaller, it has a lower gravity, and so the reason why you're not seeing quite as garish uh, contrast in colors is that the lower gravity means that the clouds actually extend deeper, and so basically we're seeing mostly the top layer of clouds. We're looking mostly at the ammonia ice clouds, and so that's why the coloration is different. And then I can tell a lot about the rings of Saturn because they are pretty much as bright as the planet, but I can see through them, so they're not a solid disk. So I need something that's really good at reflecting light, like ices, to make up the rings. And Saturn's rings are millions, billions of icy particles, each in orbit around Saturn like a little moon above the equator of Saturn. So if you could stand on the the equator of Saturn, which you can't because it's a big ball of gas. But if you could stand on the equator of Saturn, the rings would just be a line going across the sky. And the difference in reflection here, the brighter the ring looks, the more particles are grouped there. The darker the rings, the fewer particles. And then there's actually a tiny, it's hard to see here, but there actually is a gap uh, in the rings where there's a tiny little moon that orbits there and it swept the orbits clear. Saturn's rings are fascinating. I had to show you the, the final Cassini image of Saturn in full. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft was out at Saturn for, gosh, 14 years, 13 years, 14 years or something like that. And it just finished its mission in uh, September of 2017. Um, and I, and real, I got so bummed about it. I, when I gave a, a, a farewell to Cassini uh, planetarium show at the Fleet Center, I had somebody actually give me a little thing of Kleenex with a Saturn sticker on it because um, I've been spoiled my entire professional career. I could go to the Cassini spacecraft site and get new images of Saturn every day to show my classes if I wanted to. And if you are an artist, the interplay of light and shadow in Saturn's rings and its moons, quite frankly, too, um, it's the best place in the solar system to actually study the contrast. It's really, really beautiful. So I'll try not to cry over Cassini now. I've had a year to get over it, but it hasn't happened. Uranus and Neptune, they're practically twins. They're made out of the same stuff that Jupiter and Saturn are, but they're different colors. So we have to ask ourselves, why is that? 
Well, all four Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are mostly hydrogen and helium. But Uranus and Neptune have more methane. Some of you may know methane is a good greenhouse gas, which means it's good at absorbing infrared. It's also good at absorbing red, which means it reflects back more blue. And the outer layers of, of Uranus and Neptune, Neptune is about 3% methane, uh, Uranus is about 2% methane. So you actually see a strong effect on their colors and their contrast there. Um, we have these images of Uranus and Neptune from the Voyager 2 spacecraft, the only time we've ever visited uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uh, we would like to get back out there at some point because we barely even scratched the interesting surfaces of their moons. Speaking of moons, all right, so the planets are actually the boring part of the solar system. Uh, where all the interesting stuff is is the moons. Uh, these are the four largest moons of Jupiter, uh, the Galilean satellites called so because they were discovered by Galileo back on a night in 1610. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, these are all true color images. They are to scale with each other, both color saturation and size scale. To give you a sense of feel for it, uh, Io and Europa are about the same size as our own moon. Um, Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. It's larger than Pluto. It's larger than Mercury. If I put Ganymede in orbit around the sun, you'd be, oh, look, a new planet. I mean, you'd be comfortable with that. I just love showing them because look at the color contrast. You now know that just looking at them, there's different chemistry going on. There, there's something going on that's different that makes each of these worlds unique from each other. So I wanted to give you a few highlights. Uh, let's take a closer look up at Io that sort of, a lot of people refer to it as a pizza looking moon. I like my pizza to look better than that thing on the left personally, but it does represent the color. Um, this is a closer up image of Io. And when I take a look at a world that has very little to no atmosphere, I expect craters all over the surface if it doesn't have any geology going on. Because if there's no atmosphere to protect it from getting hit, if it's an old surface, it's just been hit a lot. So I should just see crater after crater after crater. This is a smooth world with orange and yellow sulfur compounds thought to be uh, emitted by active volcanoes, because every time we have sent a spacecraft close enough to Io to see it, we have seen active volcanoes. This is the most vol actively, vol no, most geologically active object in the solar system. We see lava flows, multiple volcanoes in eruption at the same time, and they outgas sulfur compounds, and that tends to give the sort of yellowish orangish color. And then I also wanted to show you an image of Europa, one of uh, Jupiter's other moons close up, one of the most intriguing places in the solar system, another smooth world, uh, not many craters at all, uh, but it's ice. And how do you get smooth ice? That's fresh ice. How do you get fresh ice? You have to have a source of water. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the most interesting findings so far that we've had in the solar system is that we actually think that there is a liquid water ocean underneath this crust of water ice and that these are cracks in the ice and we get material from underneath mixing on up through. Um, one of the ways that the liquid water oceans have been um, sort of verified is by their effects on the magnetic fields of these moons, because a couple of these moons do have magnetic fields. Um, the New York Times uh, science section yesterday ran an article on Margie Kivelson, uh, a 90-year-old professor of emerit emeritus at UCLA. Um, she was my one of my mentors when I was an undergrad at UCLA, an amazing woman. And um, she is still working on it. And she was one of the people that learned how to use magnetic fields to give indications of water oceans underneath surfaces. So it was an interesting article if you want to go read that, thought I would mention that. This is Enceladus, uh, one of the moons of Saturn. Once again, another surface of water ice. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft actually witnessed water geysers. So we've actually seen liquid water come up from underneath the surface. Uh, 
And so when we talk about water in astronomy, we're always looking for water, because if we ever want to go out there somewhere and stay there, we, we, we kind of need water. Um, and so it turns out that the places with the most water in the solar system tend to be these moons of the outer planets. Um, and they are the only places that have liquid water close to the surface. There have been some interesting findings on Mars that maybe water still exists as liquid as trickles from time to time. So could, yeah, there's a couple different interpretations of the data. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll let that one play out. This is Saturn. You've got the rings. You've got the shadow of the rings. And then you've got this orange ball, this orange fuzzy ball here. This is Titan. It's the largest moon of Saturn. It is the second largest moon in the solar system, and it is a vivid orange blob. It has a dense atmosphere. It's actually more dense than the Earth's atmosphere, mostly made out of nitrogen. So that makes it the atmosphere in the solar system that is the most similar to Earth, believe it or not, nitrogen and then argon. Just none of that oxygen that living creatures have outgassed over the, over the billions of years that we've been around. And the orange compounds tend to come from hydrocarbons and their interactions with UV radiation from the sun. So we actually see methane, ethane, propane uh, in the atmosphere of Titan. And at the temperatures and atmospheric pressure, it rains out onto the surface. So we have very good evidence of li liquids on the surface. In this case, the Cassini spacecraft was much closer to Titan than, than, uh, Saturn, than Saturn itself. Um, Titan is bigger than, it's about the size of Mercury, just to give you a sense of scale. So, so it's still a small-ish object. Saturn just big. It's just big. Here's the Earth. The large moons of the solar system to scale with each other. I like to use this as an example to try to convince people that the moons are the interesting places in the solar system. Because look at all of the different just by looking at the colors now, you get an, an incredible idea of environmental contrast on all of them. They don't look, all look like our moon. And a lot of them are smaller than our moon. Um, so is Pluto, for that matter. But I'll get to Pluto in a few minutes. I love Pluto. I'm not picking on Pluto, I promise. A couple more places to explore in the solar system. This is Ceres, the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. Uh, it is currently being visited by NASA's Dawn spacecraft, although the Dawn spacecraft is very close to end of mission. It should probably be ending its mission within the next couple weeks, if I recall correctly. And one of the most interesting things about Ceres is that when the Dawn spacecraft got close, it noticed some bright splotches in craters. And you should immediately now think, oh, that, that has to be ice to be that reflective. And it turns out that this is kind of a briny, salty ice. It might be an example of cryovolcanism, which is a, basically a way of saying it's a volcano, but it's cold, right? So, and that, again, we might have reservoirs of water underneath the surface of an object that's being brought to the surface by volcanism. It's really, really interesting. Um, the actual patterns of the bright splotches have actually changed in the time that Dawn has been observing. Um, this is an artist's representation of Sedna, which is way, 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 way out in the solar system, even past Pluto, such that that big bright dot up there, that's what the sun would look like. So you never would have brought out a yellow crayon to, to draw that, right, and make a big ball. Uh, I wanted to show you Sedna to give you an example of how difficult it can be to use light to figure out the size of an object in the solar system. So here is Earth, our moon, Pluto, and an object called Quar that's also out in that part of the solar system. And then Sedna is always listed as having a possible range of sizes. And it's, you might be wondering, why is it so hard to get its size? Well, it depends on what it's made out of. If it's mostly rocky, it would reflect back less light. If it's mostly icy, it would reflect back more light. So I would get the same amount of light from a smaller icy object as I would from a larger, darker object. And so since it's so far out in the solar system, we have a hard time getting a handle on what its surface is made out of. We tend to quote it as a size range. Um, and so uh, it can actually be difficult to know what these objects are made of. That's why it was so important to finally get out to Pluto. Okay, Pluto's not a planet. It's not a planet. It's not a planet. It's way too interesting to be a planet. Because look at this thing. 
Isn't that gorgeous? <coughs> so in 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft got to Pluto. We launched it in 2006. It passed the orbit of the moon in nine hours. It passed Jupiter in 2007. At that time, it was the fastest object we had ever watched. And it still didn't get out to Pluto till 2015. It took nine years to get out there. So the, we sent it there really fast. The bad part of that was that it was going over 30,000 miles per hour when it flew by Pluto. So it basically took pictures really, 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 really quick of the half that was lit up by the sun and kept going. You're kind of glad about that because this New Year's Day, it's going to pass close to something else. It'll be the farthest object we've ever visited in the solar system, an object called MU69. Right? So, so look forward to me getting really, really excited on New Year's Day if all goes well. Um, the day that the New Horizons spacecraft flew by Pluto, I was on Twitter just like manically refreshing the New Horizons Twitter feed because the images tend to show up on Twitter and social media faster than anywhere else currently. And I saw this image and I was like bursting into tears. My husband comes running out to the living room and was like, what's wrong? And I pointed at my computer and went, Pluto, and he just turned around and left the room. <laughs> um, Pluto was incredibly surprising. Uh, even with the Hubble Space Telescope, Pluto was pixelated and we could just see contrasts between sort of brighter regions and darker regions. So we felt comfortable that there was like more ice in some areas and more rock in other areas. Uh, that was about as good as it got. We were not expecting a world that had large, smooth expanses of ice. Um, this sort of reddish material on its surface. Um, mostly due to something called tholins, which is an organic compound that interact, that gets reddish with its interaction with sunlight. Um, we don't find those chemicals naturally here on Earth, but we see these reddish compounds throughout the outer part of the solar system. Um, that ice is nitrogen ice, not the sort of stuff we tend to find here on Earth with traces of methane ice and carbon dioxide ice. We see Mountains of water ice, literal mountains made of water ice on Pluto. Pluto is fantastic. It's way too interesting to be a planet. If you still think Pluto should be a planet, just don't, don't make it that boring, right? Pluto's awesome. So right now, the technical term, they're not planets. They're called dwarf planets. And I'm like, that's a horrible name because don't say it's not a planet and then call it something that has planet in the name because words have meaning. This has been frustrating me for, for years, since 2006. Um, basically, in the meeting of the International Astronomical Union in 2006, uh, we had to decide whether or not Pluto was still going to be considered with a planet because uh, Mike Brown up at Caltech, who goes by the name Pluto Killer on Twitter, he does, I'm not kidding, um, he had discovered an object uh, out past Pluto that is at least as big, if not larger, than Pluto. And so he basically finally said, look, we got to deal with Pluto because a lot of astronomers haven't considered Pluto a planet for years. We're just, you know, used to it. Um, and so uh, they came up with a compromise term called dwarf planet, in part because that same year the New Horizons spacecraft was getting launched. And there is a, how shall I put this politely? There was a concern when your mission funds are largely determined by non-scientists in Congress that if it's not visiting something as important as a planet, they might not give it the funding it deserves. Anyway, so yeah, this is, this is a whole separate thing that can raise my blood pressure. But we, I like to refer to it as one of the largest Kuiper Belt objects, because it's out in a part of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt, which is where we see a lot of icy objects like this. Um, so Pluto is actually a large and important example of those sorts of objects, as opposed to a pathetic excuse of a planet, right? It's smaller than our moon. OK, so speaking of moons, Pluto has five of them. This is its largest moon, Charon. Uh, they're not um, to scale in terms of their separation. They are to scale in terms of size and color. Yeah. So isn't that amazing, the difference in color? I have just been screaming over Charon even more than Pluto over the last couple of years. Um, Charon is 
has a crack that goes all the way across it. It is in part thought that it might have been like the Incredible Hulk. When Banner turns into the Hulk, he tends to expand and burst through his clothes. It is thought that this crack might have come from during one of the uh, freezing times where the ice actually is changing its shape and it might have actually cracked. Um, that's one of the ideas. You may also notice the similarity in the reddish coloration from the stolons, those organic compounds interacting with uh, solar UV radiation, but not seeing the nitrogen ice, right? The colors are very, very different. I, I want to go back to Pluto, and quite frankly, I also want to go back to the moons of Uranus and Neptune, because there are some moons with large cracks around those worlds that look very similar to this. So there's obviously a population and a process going on out there that we don't completely understand because we haven't been out there enough. This is our moon, right? The dark regions. The lunar maria are places where impacts so strong that burst through the crust of the moon, dredging up lava from underneath, repaving. So you get both a smoother surface in those areas and they have a higher iron content when we brought back rocks from the maria in the highlands. They're also younger in age because we've also, we can do radiometric dating on the highlands and the maria. But just to finish off here with our exploration of colors of space, this is actually an image of the moon crossing in between a spacecraft and the Earth. Look at that color contrast. Isn't that amazing? Basically, the moon looks really bright in the sky to our eye because it reflects about 10% of the light that hits it, and it's close to us. So if it's only reflecting about 10% of the light, that means it's kind of darkish. And one of the reasons why I like this image is it does give you a more characteristic understanding of its color. It's like a charcoal briquette in terms of its coloration for the most part. And everything that we think of as representing life here, like the blue water, the greenish browns of the continents and so on, the moon looks colorless and to a certain extent, right? Uh, what did Buzz Aldrin say on the moon? It looked like magnificent desolation, right? And so a very different color contrast and in fact, the moon contrasting with the earth is probably a good way to finish up our exploration of the colors of space. Uh, because uh, one of the biggest complaints I get in Astronomy 101 is, Dr. Will, you made us feel small, <laughs> right? Because we start in the solar system, we expand out to the stars, to our galaxy, to galaxies in general. But I think it's amazing how much we can learn trapped on this tiny little world around a very boring, quite frankly, star. And we can tease so much information out of the universe. And so part of that is through the colors we see. And hopefully you have a better feel for how we do that. So thank you very much for attending tonight. And I'll happily answer questions.